Hello, First Unitarian. As this is my last formal homily to you as your ministerial intern, I thought I'd come to you from our sanctuary. First off, First Unitarian, I want to say thank you. Thank you for a wonderful year full of challenge, relationship, fun, and success. Thank you for all the support, ideas, and encouragement. And thank you for sharing your lives and your hearts with me. Being an intern minister is initially terrifying. In seminary, I've learned theories of religious education. I've studied preaching. I've learned Unitarian Universalist history and theology. I've learned about professional boundaries and theories of pastoral care. I've read Foucault and Fanon, James Cone and Gustavo Gutierrez and Dolores Williams and Katie Cannon, and learned about liberation and post-colonialism, studied the relationship between capitalism, slavery, and empire. I've studied Afro-Caribbean religions and even begun practicing one. I've acquired a decidedly black, unabashedly womanist theological bent. But what they didn't teach me in seminary is how to make all that relevant in people's lives. how to give all that to a congregation and then trust them to wrestle with it, to take it into themselves, and to trust them to make it into something that gives life to the world. To do ministry in partnership and watch an idea loved into existence. How to take all that knowledge and make meaning of it. You as a congregation have taught me that this year. And I'm so grateful. So by way of a thank you, I want to share with you a few of the lessons I've learned this year, because I think they're not just relevant to a minister at the start of their career. Hopefully they're helpful to all of us. It'll come as no surprise to you by now, I think, that they come from a liberation theological perspective. So first, the process is, just, is much more important than the outcome. Our culture has trained us to focus on the goal, on measurable results. But it is in the process that we get to know one another. It's in the process that we challenge one another. It's in process that we learn to respect each other's experience and difference. And sometimes it's only in the process where we figure out where we really need to go. And in a time like this, when many of the events and happenings and plannings we thought were going to come to fruition have been delayed or canceled due to COVID-19, this can be somewhat comforting. Some of our goals haven't been reached on the expected schedule. Food at FUSD, which explores putting on a community meal here every Sunday, has been put on the back burner. But we've had some good conversations and done some research on how to engage some of our immediate neighbors. Family Promise is not currently being housed in our space, but we've learned exactly how committed our congregants are to the families that are served by it. Our Multicultural Transformation Workshop has been postponed, but in planning, we've taken the first steps to forming an accountability relationship with Columbine UU Church. Mike mentioned in his homily last week that many of us are hoping that this crisis will be the beginning of the building of a new world, that the cruelty and inequity of our old way of doing things, having been exposed, will be banished as we create a world that cares for and sustains all of us. It only takes the will. And yet, this isn't the first time when we've said, surely this must be the beginning of something new. It surely has to change now. We've been disappointed. We've been disappointed because our ideals haven't been met. Our dreams have not been achieved. But friends, what if in this confusing time, we focus on the journey rather than the destination? What if the process of making connections, of drawing our circle wider, of learning how to talk to those who have very different opinions from us becomes the whole exercise. Which leads me to lesson two. Lead with your heart. Value relationship over knowledge. Now, 
this one is challenging for me. I mean, have you met me? Always in my head. But this year, I saw people really wrestle with the question of how do we talk with people who we're not necessarily used to being in relationship with. The Food at FUSD project has stalled for obvious re reasons, but in the planning of it, we talked about how we form relationship with people. For instance, the unhoused folks in our neighborhood whose experience were alien to some of us. How do we get to know people who are not part of our day-to-day -day lives? And we revisited the discussion of how best to serve Jeanette in these challenging and changing political and legislative times, probably even more challenging than when Sanctuary began at First Unitarian. And we've had some conversations about race that were deeply personal for me and not emotionally easy for anyone involved. And through all of it, I've seen this congregation individually and collectively lean in to uncomfortable discussions, not out of intellectual interest, but from hearts full of love and a deep yearning for connection. These discussions didn't always yield intellectual agreement, but they did yield understanding and connection, mutual respect and direction. And I would argue that as we do our best to stay safe during this pandemic, and as we begin to plan what the world will look like when we come out of it, it will be our ability to have and lead conversations and to express care across boundaries of experience and ideology that will be key to building a new and more just world. In a recent online teach-in hosted by Rising Majority, activist Naomi Klein said, crisis blows open the sense of what is possible. People are scared and hurting that right now. But they're also waiting. Some are just now waking up to the fact that they've been yearning for more engaged, more loving, more connected world. And not in the sense that we've gotten used to hearing it, more connected technologically or more connected economically, but more connected emotionally, more connected spiritually, more able to recognize and value as holy our common spirit and common humanity. Klein went on, our job is to kick open the door of radical possibility as wide and as long as possible. Which, for me, brings us to lesson three. Faith is one of the biggest parts of leadership. Faith in your congregation, faith in process, faith in the collective will to make things better, and faith in spirit, what people are being led to do. I learned so much from Mike about process this year, and systems, and change. But I've also learned from him how to love a congregation through transformation and how to encourage them to love each other through it too. Y'all are really good at that. And in order to be an effective minister, it's absolutely important to know the tools of your trade. But knowing your stuff is important precisely in order to produce the conditions that allow spirit to move, to aid and allow a community to discern its needs and the needs of the wider world. Rob McCoy, who co-hosts a podcast called Pulpit Fiction, had this to say in regard to faith. When can we go back to normal is not a faithful question. When can we go back to normal is not a faithful question. So in our UU context, what does that mean? Well, you've all heard me preach liberation this year. The idea that God is on the assumption on the side of the oppressed, and that the major systems keeping us from our sacred connection to one another in our time are white supremacy, patriarchy, and neoliberal capitalism. And so we know that the argument that is playing out in our culture and in our political arena is a false choice. The idea that we must choose between productivity and human lives, that's a lie. 
What the most powerful in our society want us to think is that the system wherein a person's life and livelihood are measured entirely in the ability to produce and consume ever more is just a fact of life, a fact of natural law, a given, that success measured by Wall Street is the measure of a society and that work or die are the only choices available. Friends, we know better. We know that a human life is all by itself an expression of the divine. We know that the worth of a human being lies in that person's connection to all of us, not in how much they produce. A faithful response, then, one that trusts and lives into justice and love and connection, means trusting our collective liberation from the capitalism that places a dollar value on human lives and from the racism that dictates that black people and Native Americans die from coronavirus at three and four times the rate of white people. Faith in each other, faith in the universe, faith in our collective divinity means that we trust in our ability and our will to create a future that includes our collective liberation and our collective thriving. So I hope the lessons you've taught me about leadership are also helpful as you go into a post-COVID world, virtually or physically, to transform it into a place of greater love and justice. Trust the process, lead with your heart, have faith in one another and in divine connection. And since it was you all that taught me these lessons, my parting charge to you is this. Keep doing what you do so well, only more so. Keep leaning into discomfort, keep challenging the status quo, keep laughing with one another, dancing with one another, albeit from a distance right now. Keep loving one another boldly and keep expanding your definitions of what it means to love one another and of who one another includes. This way lies liberation. In matters of white supremacy culture, don't be scared. Learn more. Do your best. If you screw up, do your best to make amends. That's the best any of us can do. As we head into a difficult election, remember that we don't win by compromising on love. We don't win by accepting oppression from any side or refusing to hold our candidates accountable. We don't ultimately win by compromising our sacred values. I have the distinct privilege of taking each and every one of you into my career with me. I take forward the immense joy of connection to a community that is so dedicated to love and justice. Thank you, First Unitarian. I love you. Now as the music plays, I invite you to answer our Take Time to Wonder questions, which are, what is liberation asking you to do today? And what have you learned from this community this year? 